Godot Tutorials is not sponsored by or affiliated with the Godot game engine. So what exactly should you learn next? And I want to separate this into two categories. One is understanding the basics of computer science. And the second is understanding software project development. For software project development, I'll point you to Git and GitHub. Once you've understood Git and GitHub, take a look into understanding trunk-based development. Understanding Git and trunk-based development will help you work in groups. But in this episode, I'm going to cover basically the basics of computer science, which is data structures, algorithms, and big old notation, because we can use these to improve our ability to refactor. Let's start with data structures. Data structures is understanding code and its row in data management and organization. Data structure teaches us about the pros and cons and the different ways of organizing data. The two data structures that you have learned so far, if you took any of my previous courses, is the array and dictionary. Arrays are ordered collections, while dictionaries are unordered collections. Both are used to manage data, but their purposes vary. If we take a look here, we have two different ways of organizing our values 0, 10, 20, 30. In an array, we can group them on a single line, or if the language supports it, we can push the values to the back of the array. Arrays are also useful for any type of management where we would like to control how data is ordered. Dictionaries are great when we need a key to associate itself to a value and when we don't really care about the order of our values. Both can be iterated by for loops in GDScript. Again, arrays are great at organizing the placement of data in the order you want, such as organizing an array from smallest integer to largest integer, or organizing strings by alphabetical order. Arrays can be made more powerful with the creation of 2D arrays and 3D arrays. The negative of arrays, however, is that you are unable to access a specific piece of data outside of knowing where the placement of that data is in the array. And lastly, accessing 2D and 3D arrays can get quite complex. Dictionaries, on the other hand, are basically the polar opposite of arrays. Dictionaries are great when you want an easy way to identify and access a piece of data. For example, if we just want the first name of a person, we can just use dictionary first name or dictionary last name for the person's last name. Again, because dictionaries are a key value pair, as long as you know what the name of the key is, you will always get the value associated to that key. The negatives of dictionaries is that there is no way of organizing the order of data. And this is again because we have a key value association. We only care about the specific value to a specific key rather than the order our values are in. And the last negative is that keys must be unique, although this is a pro or con depending on how you look at it. Next is algorithms. Algorithms is simply step-by-step -step procedure to be followed to reach a desired result. If you followed my courses from the beginning, you were introduced to a few ways that will aid us in building algorithms. The most common one is the for loop, which is great when you need to iterate over an entire data set or collection of data. Again, we can use for loops for dictionaries and arrays. Algorithms don't have to be complex. As a matter of fact, if you've used a for loop to iterate through an array, then you've used an algorithm. A for loop inside of another for loop is an algorithm, and it's a great algorithm if you want to iterate over a 2D array. To iterate over a 3D array, you use a for loop inside a for loop, which is inside yet another for loop. Lastly, even though big O notation is outside the scope of this series and this episode, since I am doing a soft intro into data structs and algorithms to improve or optimize any algorithm you build yourself, there is no way of avoiding the understanding of at least the basics when it comes to big O notation and how it applies to your code. As a matter of fact, when starting out with learning big O notation, I recommend to learn to count code and count steps in your code. Counting code is different than counting steps because counting code lets you know how many lines are needed to be written. Counting steps lets you know how many lines are needed to run to complete a specific test. However, just understanding or learning to count code will vastly improve your ability to refactor. Anyway, let's go into a soft intro into big O notation. Again, it doesn't have to be complicated. As a matter of fact, you've always been exposed to big O notation if you watch any videos on coding. Let's take a look at this example. With big O notation, we say that the function called test, which takes in zero arguments or has zero parameters, 
takes two steps to complete, and that is because each print statement, each line of code, is a single step. And since we have two print statements, that means function test takes two steps to process and complete. Now let's change this up a bit and add a parameter to our function. So here's a trick question. How long does our function take to run and complete if we have an array with a length of 1,000? Basically, 1,000 items inside our array. And the answer is it still takes two steps to process and complete our function test, despite having an argument, more specifically an array passed inside our test function that has 1,000 items. Now let's add two more print statements. And now our code takes four steps to complete. And as you notice here, it's getting a little bit annoying that I have to mention how many steps a function takes to complete. And so is there an easier way to describe all of these functions? And yes, we can say that our code runs at constant time. And if you want to get into big O notation, we would say O1 or O of 1. And this is because no matter how big our argument, more specifically, no matter how large our array grows, our function will take the same amount of steps to complete. The number of steps that function test must take does not grow or shrink. Therefore, we can say that it runs constant time. Now, again, we don't really need to know big O notation. Just focus on learning to count code because we can use that to analyze our code in order to refactor it or find areas in our code that need refactoring. Before I go over a small coding example, which I will not upload to GitHub, let's take a look at how we can use data structures, algorithms, and big O notation to improve our ability to refactor our code, more specifically a dictionary, a for loop, and just basic counting code. So here we are. Let's go ahead and see how we can at least use the basics of algorithms, data structures, and big O notation counting code to help improve refactoring. And more specifically, we're going to head to music folder. We're going to take a look at Background Manager. Now over here, we have Background Manager. And let's just count code right now. So it's easier if I sort of, OK, now that I've grouped our code, so it's easier for us to view, let's ask ourselves a question. For every music file we want to add into Background Manager, how many lines of code will we have to write? OK, so to answer that question, let's go ahead and count the code. So first, we need to actually grab the files. So that's one line of code. We also need a music name to play that file, so two lines of code. We need the specific length of that file, so three lines of code. Next, we need to actually add this animation, and so we say four lines of code. And lastly, we need to play the animation in order to have the music play in our game, and that is five lines of code. So basically, by counting, we can say that for every music file we want to add to our game, we're going to need five lines of code. And that's just a hypothesis. This is where the computer science thing comes into play. It's a hypothesis. However, we do have the sound manager class, which has a lot of files. And let's see if that holds true. So in this case, we have the bounce file. So we grab the file of our bounce sound. We also need the length. We also need the name. We also need to actually add the animation. So right there is four lines of code. And then lastly, we have to play it. So that's five lines of code. And as a matter of fact, you can see we did that five times. So we have five different files. We have five different functions to call in order to play the sound. And we've created five animations. And so in a sense, our theory is true. So how exactly can we use data structures and algorithms to reduce the lines of code and making it easier to maintain our code? So right now, this doesn't look like a big deal because our line is under 100. But imagine if you wanted this file to hold just 20 different sound files. And so you can imagine that by having 20 sound files, we're going to have at least 100 lines of code. And then if we want to change something, it's going to be hard to change because we have to look in five different locations. So for example, if we want to add a sound, we need to add five lines of code. And if we want to delete a sound, we need to delete five lines of code. And so just managing this at a bigger scale is going to be a headache. And so this is where data structures and algorithms come into play. Now, I'm not going to refactor this. I'm just going to show you a simple example through the background manager. And let's go ahead and do that now. So first is the data structure. And I'm going to put that here. I'm just going to leave a big space. Now, in this case, we just need a dictionary. And over here, we just need two things. Because dictionaries are key value pairs, the dictionary is a great way to manage 
are sound files and sound names. For example, the sound name will be the key, the sound file will be the value. And so we can just copy and paste that here. And as you can see right there, we have this way of pairing our name of the file background music to the actual file. And that's basically it. Now we have one location to manage the name of our file and the location of our file. And so having one place to manage inside a dictionary is better than our sound manager where if we want to change something, we have to find it, we have to look for it, and then we have to edit it. Now that we've created a dictionary, let's go ahead and create an algorithm that allows us to create all the necessary music files for our game to use, no matter how little or how large our dictionary is. Let me go ahead and move a few files. And it's actually going to be quite simple. All we really need to do is iterate over our dictionary and change two lines of code, the background file variable and the background music name variable. To iterate over a dictionary, all we really need is four key in dictionary. Take those two lines of code. Make sure we remove the preload because we are not in the class scope anymore. We're inside the ready virtual method. And the ready virtual method is like the preload keyword. And so in this case, what we're doing is our background file will load the dictionary with the specific key value, in this case, background music, and the value associated to our key background music. And then we can just associate our key to the background music name. And there we go. We have our algorithm. However, our algorithm doesn't actually create the animation. And so we need to complete everything. And I'm just going to copy and paste these three lines of code. And there we go. Now we have this algorithm that lets us create our music files, no matter how many key value pairs in our dictionary we have. And as you can see here, by doing this one trick, by using the simple basics of data structures and algorithms, we can turn something like the sound manager, which has about 25 lines of code just dedicated to preparing our files and music for our game. And we can turn that into just five simple lines. And so now we can say that for every music file we have, it's only going to take one line of code. And I'll give you another example. Let's say we want multiple background musics. Well, we can say background music one, background music two. And there we go. We can actually choose. And all we have to do is add one line of code to add music to our game or remove one line of code in order to remove one music from our game. And that's the basics of big O notation, just the ability to count code. Now where big O notation comes into play is the for loop. Our for loop is not constant time like I showed you in the slideshows. Our for loop would be considered O of N. In a sense, that means that our for loop will run N amount of times, N being the amount of key value pairs are inside our variable called dictionary. And so our for loop can run once all the way to a thousand times if that's what we have. Now, lastly, we do have a problem. Let me show you what that problem is with our current code right now. So we have background music. We have background music too. How can we play the music we want? And so in our sound manager, we do have something like this down here. We could create a function and then play it based on the name, but you'll notice here that that grows with the amount of files we want to play. However, there is something to note, and that is we are doing code duplication. It's the same line of code over and over again. And what do we do? We can extract into function. How do we do that? Well, And there we go. We could actually just remove this line of code and actually use our function. And there we go. Our game runs. It plays the music. And that's basically it. Now we have this way of reducing the amount of lines of code while maintaining the purpose and function of our class. And so notice here that if we keep adding things, you'll start to see that our code doesn't grow anymore except for what we add or remove in our dictionary. And so that's one way of using algorithms and data structures and the basics of counting code in order to improve our ability to refactor. And so you can imagine how it will help our sound manager. 
which still has one music file equals five lines of code. And you know what? I'm actually going to add this into GitHub. So I'll upload this to GitHub and please feel free to play around and edit and or improve my code. The last thing I want to mention is when you finalize code, it's always good to remove comments if you're using Git. As a matter of fact, you should be using Git. That's why I introduced it earlier in the slideshows, because if you're using Git, you can delete comments. And if you ever need to relook at your comments, you just go back into your Git project or GitHub and look at the version history. So towards the end of the project, again, start deleting your comments, start deleting your debugging. For example, those print statements, I believe we have a print statement inside of miscellaneous and more specifically the math class. Right here, we can start deleting our prints on top of deleting print statements and comments. Towards the end of the project, you may want to add code, more specifically comments to describe what your functions do. For example, in this case, I have a comment that specifically states that our function primitive normal distribution returns a float value, specifically values between 0.0, .0 and 1.0 with a normal distribution around 0.5. On top of that, we can have to do later sections in our comments to remind us what we may want to do later if we ever come back to the project. Also, if you have parameters, you can add parameters as well. So let me go ahead and give you an example of that in our vector rotation. We can do the same organization style to remind us what exactly our functions do. So in this case, we declare the, the parameters, the data type it expects, and a small description of what that value should be, and of course, the return value. And so you can do that for every function you have. It's a great way to remind yourself what each function does when you come back to the code months later. So a little bit of code cleanup. So again, just remember, remove all the print statements you have for debugging your debugging code. Remove comments, replace them by a more descriptive comments at the top of your functions to describe what it does, what it returns, what values it needs to be provided in order for the function to work. Lastly, since we are towards the end of the project lifecycle, basically we are in the polishing stage. We've just finished refactoring. The next step is to optimize your code. Maybe your code can be improved. One example is the randomize method here. Randomize gets called every time our function gets called and our function gets called every time our ball makes contact with the paddle. And randomize only needs to be called once. There are pros and cons to this. For example, if you extract randomize out, you have to make sure you call it. Whereas if we keep it inside our static function, whoever calls our function, at least they will be guaranteed that the seed is randomized. So something to keep in mind. Another optimization to look into is the size of your music files. For example, our background music is actually about 15 megabytes in size. Maybe that's too big for a game, especially for something that's only a minute long. Maybe we need to look into decreasing the size, which is especially useful since we are exporting into HTML and our game will not play until all 13 megabytes has been loaded into your browser. And so keep that in mind as well. That's another optimization to look into. Another optimization is your for loops. For example, we're iterating six times every time our ball makes contact with the paddle. Maybe we need to decrease this into four or two. That's up to you. Lastly, since we're towards the end of the project, we can look at our debugger, look at the errors. We can actually fix the errors we have here. So let's take a look at a few of them. We may want to actually listen to what we're doing. Keep in mind that the add animation returns a value, whereas before, Add animation didn't return a value. It used to return void or nothing. And so it, it's up to you if you want to do something about it. Normally and naturally, it's a good idea to actually get rid of these errors because normally it means you're doing something that the game engine doesn't like. Lastly, we can use the profiler to debug our game to notice slow spots. We can head to debugger. We can head to Profiler and we can actually look at our code and we can see issues with our code. In this case, 
You can notice that our physics frame is taking the brunt of our code. And if we want to optimize, we can take a look at everything inside our physics virtual method. And it's just basically that our paddles are moving. Now that we went ahead and looked at profiler and our errors, we can actually take a look at removing something in our game state, more specifically, the space bar we added. And over here, we have the check change state. We can actually delete that. And now when we run our game, space bar does not stop our game from playing because that was a debug feature. Now we removed it. And that's basically it when it comes to refactoring. And, and, that's, and this is basically it. Now we have our complete game ready to be used. And so again, I'm just going to upload everything to GitHub. So please feel free to download, play around, mess around, and most importantly, practice. Well, that's all I have for you in this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for clicking the like button and thank you for clicking the subscribe button. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have an amazing day.